Oddball is made possible by supporters of WJCT Public Media, with additional support from Bold Bean Coffee Roasters. While this podcast might be a mystery, Bold Bean's coffee isn't. Ethically sourced bags of beans are roasted to highlight their origin, characteristics, and natural sweetness. So when you order that latte, you're supporting transparency and quality at every step of the coffee chain. Bold Bean, sourcing, roasting, brewing, and serving outstanding coffee. From WJCT Public Media in Jacksonville, this is Episode 3 of Oddball. I'm Lindsay Kilbride. The trucks would break down on the highway and the driver would call her and say, you know, something's wrong with it. And so she would probe him with questions. She would just have these real strong instincts or gut feelings. I quickly realized that if I was going to ask the family anything about the bet sphere, I was not going to get anywhere with the family. They say it definitely is not a fall valve. She took me around and she showed me some of the places where some of the strange events had occurred. The house was built in uh, the late 1920s. Nettleton Neff, he shot himself and uh, he never lived in the house. And we found the house. We found the house. <laughs> This is definitely the type of area that inspires paranormal thinking. Yeah. So you talked to Jerry on Monday? I did. Years before I started reporting this story, and also just within the last few months, other podcasters, YouTubers, and bloggers have published their own research and thoughts about the Beth Sphere. But one in particular by the podcast Astonishing Legends came out during the peak of my research, which led to sort of a mid-series crisis. Okay. I think it was Friday. It was put on my radar. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's had a different podcast. Um, basically did the same story I'm working on, (laughs) which is a major gut punch. (laughs) And, um, I know I mentioned it to you earlier in the week, but I was definitely considering just dropping it, but I don't know. Do you think that still should be something to consider? Or do you think that we're kind of making enough headway where this is going to be good on its own? I think, I think we should go ahead and go with it. Yeah, I, I I totally feel like we should go with it. I just feel like the the way that it's going to be presented is going to be great. Yeah, not even think I know. It's weird to listen back to this because I was so close to quitting this project. All I needed was a nudge in that direction. Now I definitely don't feel that way, but I couldn't ignore this other podcast, so I instead called up the hosts who are super cool and nice, and I talked to them about their findings, which I'll have a little later. But one interesting tidbit I gathered from their research is relevant to what I'm about to get into. An anonymous source who said she's a Betts family member, although not Jerry, told those podcast hosts a more exact location of where the ball was found. We really only knew it was found somewhere in the woods on the Betts' acres and acres of property. Assuming she's telling the truth, that's helpful information because it pertains to the most prolific theory said to totally debunk the mystery of the ball that it rolled off the roof of a man's VW bus. A Volkswagen is a nice station wagon to have around the house. It'll seat your whole family comfortably, average 23 miles to a gallon of regular, and hold a month's supply of groceries. A guy named James Derling Jones, who was an artist and hotel manager in Taos, New Mexico, had acquired a bunch of metal balls he was planning to use in a sculpture of a giant clock. One of those balls was sitting outside the hotel a couple weeks after the news broke of the Betts' discovery. The Coca-Cola man saw it and freaked out because it looked so similar. James Sterling Jones told the Florida Times Union he was actually driving through Jacksonville around Easter of 1971. That's almost exactly three years before the Betts ball was found. The bus was crammed full, so he stuck the spheres up in a luggage carrier on his roof, and he lost three or four of them while driving through the south. One article is even paired with a cartoon of a man driving a Volkswagen bus, balls flying out of it, and his speech bubble reading, If I can spread a few more of these things around the state, I can make Wells' War of the Worlds look like a tea party. So is this the best explanation? 
Brian Dunning, who hosts the Skeptoid podcast, different than the podcast I just spoke about, thought so when I talked to him a couple years ago. His podcast looks into different theories and legends people believe. And where there's more interesting science behind what's actually going on. And that can be anything like a, a paranormal phenomenon, a, um, an alternative medicine belief, a conspiracy theory. The, the, the whole spectrum of weird things that people believe um, is just incredibly wealthy. In 2012, he released an episode on the Beth Sphere. When I heard about this initially, my thought was, oh, well, that sounds like a, like a bladder tank from a spacecraft. Uh, because occasionally those do fall out of the sky and people in strange places find this weird metal sphere and they don't know what it is. He ruled that out because the type of tank he was thinking of would be larger and have attachments for valves. Uh, so, you know, I, I had a couple of possible explanations in my mind like that. But then you go and you read about what was reported, all of these strange properties that the ball had. And, you know, I've done enough stories like this to know that uh, reports are not always accurate, that these stories tend to grow over time substantially. And that's exactly what happened in this case as well. His main method of research? Uh, newspaper reports, uh, largely. Um, for, for doing what I do when you're trying to go back uh, so far into history, in, in some cases hundreds of years, uh, contemporary newspaper reports are often one of the best, most reliable sources. Uh, because those reports usually came from the day that it happened. There hadn't been any chances yet for anyone to magnify the story. He thinks that magnification is what's happened with this ball story. Most of the more recent blog posts and YouTube videos focus on the more outrageous claims, like that the sphere itself played organ music when, according to Sandy's article, the weird stuff at the house predated the ball, or that a scientist found the ball was made out of elements heavier than anything known to science, which I found the sourcing on that to be somewhat questionable, and we're going to get really deep into the science a little later. But I'm saying this now to point out I get where Brian is coming from. He points to the Navy's findings, that the ball was made out of stainless steel 431. That's a common industrial steel, and it's probably not likely to be something that aliens would use, so we can be pretty sure metallurgically that it's something from from some industrial plant right here on Earth. And he wasn't too fixated on the witnesses' claims of the balls rolling. I mean, things like this, they're, they're anecdotes, um, which means evidence that we can't test or verify. It's, it's an Elvis sighting. You know, when you, when you hear of an Elvis sighting, we don't conclude that, oh, therefore, someone reported seeing Elvis, therefore, Elvis is definitely still alive, and this person actually saw them. There's no other possible explanation. Well, no. It's far more likely that this person was simply mistaken. So this, when, you, when you hear an anecdote about the ball was rolling around on its own, and people who went there said, oh, their floor was really uneven. Anything you put on it's going to roll around. There's these places called mystery spots, these little tourist attractions all around the world where balls seem to roll uphill. Uh, cars seem to drive up the hill by themselves. Um, things stick to the wall. And those are simply optical illusions. And it's perfectly reasonable because of the number of people who go through those little tourist attractions and come out convinced that the Betts family could have been equally mistaken about the reason the ball was rolling around, even though the floor looked flat to them. Which brings us back to the theory he settled on. This ball fell from artist James Derling Jones's VW bus. It was an industrial ball valve. Ball check valve, that is. Made of stainless steel 431, exactly like the Betts Mystery Sphere. And it is known to have been deposited in the area uh, some years before the Betts family found it. So once we have all those little strings tied together, um, I'm satisfied that uh, it's the best explanation anyone's put forward. And I, I think it should be the, the default theory, the null hypothesis. The artist wouldn't confirm the origin of the balls to reporters back in the day because they were maybe sort of kind of stolen. He said, I can't tell you where I got them because I'd get in trouble, but I'll tell you this, they're not from outer space. He said the balls weren't perfect, otherwise they'd be worth several thousand dollars to the company that made them. And if he told reporters the company, they'd want them back. Then he said they weren't stolen, but that it would cost his friend his job. 
He did say the spheres were intended as part of an industrial valve, like the kind used in high-pressure transmission lines. Some reports say the Beth sphere had this small, smoothed-over plug in its side, and this artist described his spheres as having welded-over plugs, which I assume just means patched-up holes. He told a reporter those plugs were an attempt to smooth a surface left flawed by the sphere grinder. So I ran this by that higher up the sphere manufacturing company I spoke with earlier, and he said normally if there's a defect in a ball like a flat spot or something, they wouldn't try to fix it and then sell that ball. And I actually talked to a few different engineers who work with metal balls for a living about why one might have a hole later welded closed, and none knew a reason for it. But one guy said he actually sees balls come from China with single holes in them, and sometimes customers will ask his company to weld them smooth. But most of the engineers said a metal ball like the Betz's could be used in factories to stop and allow fluids, which happens with industrial valves like the kind the artist says his ball was intended for. I was able to track down the artist through his daughter, Sabrina. She's actually pictured in a Santa Fe newspaper article kneeling alongside her dad, each of them touching a sphere. She looks about three or four years old. But when we first spoke in February, she said her dad is really private and wouldn't give me his contact information. And unfortunately, he did not respond to my many, many emails she said she ran by him. I even asked if he'd just email me responses and sent her questions to relay to him. Nothing. I wanted to know, where did you get these balls from? What area of Jacksonville were you driving through? Did your spheres ever follow people around? How could a 20-pound metal ball just fly off your bus? Why didn't you stop and retrieve them? And did you ever get around to making that giant clock? I decided to check out where the oddball was supposedly found according to this anonymous source. Is it likely the ball would have rolled off a bus and wound up here? I forgot to show that I was watching. That Intern was, uh, Al Pete and I are parked at a mini strip mall at the intersection of Fay Road and Alta Drive. It's the only building out here, woods all around okay. us, and a railroad track. So, do you know what is what highway that is right there? Oh, that's, uh, that's 295. Okay, so 295 is yeah. the main road here. And other than that, we need to figure out, like, if Alta Drive and Fay Road, um, how developed they were then. Because even right now, it's not too, there's not too much around here. There's really just this one little strip of a diner and a Mexican restaurant. Yeah. Well, between, like, here and maybe, like, a mile up, it's mm-hmm. woods. Yeah, so the family said that... Near this intersection, there was basically a little side road, like a like a fire road, that you couldn't get to by car that they had to walk to. And I'm and down that little road is where she said the ball was allegedly found. Al did a little more digging and got back to me a couple weeks later. So how do you sort of characterize this area? It's kind of remote, I guess. Right. If you ride down um, Hexer Drive, which is maybe a mile or two south. You see a bunch of fishing. Um, I actually used to fish there. My dad, my, my stepdad used to take us there. So it's a lot of fishing and people just on, on the bridge. And then after that, it's like a row of like very nice houses. I reached out to Public Works and they stated that in the 70s that um, 295 was not uh, built at the time. The Danes Point Bridge, which connects uh, 295, was uh, built in 1989. So in the 1970s. The only way that you could access that road was Main Street, which is uh, parallel north-south. So you couldn't get off the highway to get into the area that we were at. It was just woods there. It was, uh, you know, it wasn't really too many houses there at the time. And if you was coming from up north down south, the main highway would be 95. But Main Street is like a couple of miles away from 95. So um, just to be candid about it, it'd be kind of impossible for this for the spear to kind of just fall off and roll. I mean, it would have had to roll for a long time to get there. Yeah, and I mean, that's assuming that it rolled to this area, assuming, right? correct. You assuming, know, like, correct. that's the thing. Because we don't have, you know, a current conversation with him, we're not able to confirm, and he may not even remember, you know, did you get off the highway? Right, did right. you did you know people here? Were you going fishing? Yeah, like, exactly. That type of thing. I mean, there are so <laughs> many scenarios we just don't know. Right. 
maybe it would be unlikely if he was just driving through Jacksonville that he would have wound up in that area. But what I'm thinking is, you know, this was three years before the sphere was found, right? So who knows, like, if 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 someone put it there. Also, three years ago, that would make sense as to why this ball was so beat up. Yes, it did have those, correct. So I don't want to rule it out, but I do think it's a little weird that a really heavy ball would come off someone's van and not hit another car. You would think it would be incredibly noticeable and that you would stop and try to get it back unless, you know, it rolled where you couldn't find it. Um, I totally agree. I mean, it's a 20-plus pound ball. And he even says in one of the articles when he's talking about the Beth sphere, sort of as a joke, he's like, Tell that guy to send the ball over to me. Those things aren't easy to come by. Mm. So it seemed like something that was pretty valuable to him. Right. Yeah, It's just, it's to me it just seems unlikely. But again, we're not going to rule it out. After this conversation, I found an article written by a reporter in New Mexico with some more details. It said Derling Jones had the spheres in a box on his roof. His trip took him over the highway past Jacksonville, and that's where he speculates a few balls escaped from his possession. No indication he actually drove through the area in which the ball was found. But even with some of these other explanations being floated, an extraterrestrial one was still being investigated. After the break. Oddball is made possible by supporters of WJCT Public Media with additional support from Bold Bean Coffee Roasters. Bold Bean believes in transparency and paying a fair price for a quality product. That's why the company is always working to build relationships with coffee growers like Herbert in Columbia. They're the ones that uh, make it possible for us to work without having to use any any trader or the regular usual channels for exporting and importing coffee. How coffee usually works is that the coffee growers sell it to someone in a purchase point in the town they grow coffee at or in the nearest city. That coffee gets sold or moved to dry mills and that gets forwarded to an exporter. The exporter sells it to an importer. Bobin is the importer, but they don't charge a fee on that. The market is built for you not to be able to unlock that level. And we needed that small key to open that door and Bold Bean provide that key. Taste Bold Bean's latest coffee blend called Oddball today and get an Oddball mug, a tote bag, and the ability to binge listen to all episodes of Oddball at oddballpodcast.com. Shop the listening options and merch. And remember, your contributions help WJCT make projects like this one. That's oddballpodcast.com. A woman talks to her plants, and the plants listen and act. A struggling musician is rescued from a shipwreck by a mysterious mute woman. A husband secretly finds out his wife is just a few snacks away from a massive heart attack and takes her out for an elaborate feast. What do all of these things have in common? They are just a few of the many stories told by Fireside Mystery Theater, an original anthology audio drama series that has been thrilling and entertaining audiences since 2014. It's a podcast, but more than that, it's also recorded live in front of an audience. There are fascinatingly macabre and sometimes funny tales performed by a stock company of gifted voice actors, an improvised musical score, rich sound design, songs sung by some of the best talent around, and other surprises waiting for you with each exciting episode. Find Fireside Mystery Theater on your favorite podcast player, and be sure to mind the shadows. At the time the sphere was discovered, the early 70s, the government was taking UFO claims very seriously, as reports of sightings were pouring in from across the country. They come from another world, spawned in the light years of space, unleashed to take over the bodies and souls of the people of our planet, bringing a new dimension. For this sweetheart she married, the man she had loved, was merely the hollow shell for the invaders from outer space. Bill! 
I have a reputation as, you know, a, a, a calm and reasoned and sophisticated voice on this controversial and contentious subject. Jerry Clark knows a lot about this because he's written three editions of a multi-volume UFO encyclopedia. Which is kind of considered the definitive reference work on the subject and won a number of awards. You know, there's there's a background noise of UFO reports just goes on and on. And every once in a while, they erupt into what we call a wave. And then the wave actually makes it into the not just the local press, but the national and even international press. And then interest goes up. I would say that in terms of popular interest, the 50s and 60s were the height of popular interest. The height of scientific interest was probably the the 1970s. Was it your life work to be researching this, or did you also have another career? Oh, it kind of ended up taking over my life. <laughs> And with, with just through just not by design, but that's what happened. I, the only time that I I uh, was drawing an actual paycheck for an extended period of time was I worked for Fate magazine in Chicago, and that was kind of a paranormal monthly pulp magazine. And uh, I was associate editor and then senior editor of the magazine for between the mid-70s and the end of the 1980s. And so I'm, I'm living testimony that there's no money in UFOs. Jerry says the modern UFO phenomenon really started the summer of 1947, after a pilot reported seeing a group of disc-shaped objects flying in the sky at a high speed. Other sightings soon followed, and just a few months after, the Air Force started an official program called Project Sign, looking into the claims. And Project Sign was the one time that the Air Force was actually, at least on on the level on the level of the of the investigators, the, the the lieutenants and captains and staff sergeants who were looking into the sightings, they became convinced that. These things weren't ours. They weren't Soviet in origin, so they must be from another planet. And um, in about September 1948, they sent uh, from Project Sign, which was located at, at Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio, they sent a, an estimate of the situation up to the Joint Chiefs that said that the best explanation was that there were visitors from outer space coming to Earth, and that's what was behind these flying disc reports. And the Joint Chiefs shot that down immediately and demanded that all copies of the estimate be burned so that there was no reference to any possibility that for a second the U.S. government had considered the possibility of extraterrestrial visitation a possibility. And in fact, for years afterwards, the Air Force even denied that this estimate of the situation ever existed. But it did exist, and eventually the Air Force had to admit it. Project Sign eventually turned into Project Grudge, which turned into Project Blue Book, the most well-known of the three. The goal of them quickly evolved into attaching logical explanations to UFO sightings. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. This is from a news conference in, in 1952. Air Force Intelligence Director Major General John Sanford is talking. We have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them. Explain them the scientific consultant they hired to do that explaining was J. Allen Hynek, a professor of astronomy and UFO skeptic. Uh, he was the guy that was brought on early on, like in the late 40s, to look at reports that might have an astronomical explanation. And he he was the nearest astronomer to Dayton, Ohio. He was at Ohio State University at the time. 
and um, and then Hynek got sucked into it, and for 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 pretty much the next decade and a half, pretty much he echoed the Air Force line, even though privately he was having growing doubts that this was a productive approach, and would sometimes voice them privately or even publicly, but he didn't come out as an as an actual active UFO proponent until the mid 1960s. And then he immediately became the most famous UFO proponent in the world. Project Blue Book closed down in 1969, but Heineck went on to start the Center for UFO Studies to keep investigating claims, including the Beth Sphere. See, this all ties in. The National Enquirer had assembled a team of five scientists, a blue ribbon panel of UFO investigators, it was offering a cash price to anyone who produced a UFO. The panel happened to be meeting at a New Orleans conference in late April of 74. The Betts Ball first made headlines in mid-April, so naturally, they went ahead and took a look at it. The panelists were Heineck, an astronomer, Robert Cregan, professor of philosophy, Leo Sprinkle, psychologist, Frank Salisbury, a plant physiologist, and James Harder, a civil engineer. Six days after the ball's initial headlines, a South Florida newspaper reported that Jerry said her son Terry, who found the ball, was picked up by a private plane and taken to the National Enquirer's offices in Lantana, Florida, a pit stop before heading to New Orleans for the conference. The following day, a Tampa newspaper published a story about the ball's time at the headquarters. There, employees nicknamed the ball Edward and kept it in a safe. Then, on a table on the National Enquirer's lawn, the ball rolled on its own slowly around a table that was not quite level, even rolling over the uphill portion with no apparent difficulty. The article just states this, no attribution, so it's not clear if the reporter witnessed it or if they were told about it. And remember, according to that guy Dick, Jerry's friend I spoke to in episode one, things got even weirder here. Jerry sent... Terry and Robin, her two sons, to fly down there with it, and they were going to fly back with it. Well, after a day or so, uh, the people sent the two boys back and kept the ball. And uh, that I don't think that was the way it was supposed to work, but that's what happened. But they finally got the ball back. We had that conversation in 2017. And two years later... Um, hold on, let me find my notes. I actually... Remember, this is Nan the editor who profiled Jerry in First Coast Magazine. So you talked to Jerry on Monday? I did. I call, I tracked down her info and gave her a call, and um, I forgot. I forgot what a wonderful, eloquent woman yeah. she is, you know? She's just remarkable, and she was really happy to, to hear from me. Um, she really enjoyed the article. I hadn't spoken to her since we did the article in 2016. Nan mentioned to Jerry the sphere had come up in a recent news article, and Jerry just started talking. For 30 minutes, just wow. totally went back in time and just recalled all these details from that that period of time. Including the ball being taken to this blue ribbon panel of UFO investigators. Somewhere in that window of time, someone who was organizing the panel told her son that his mother um, had been calling and needed him to return home. So he called her and tried to get a hold of her but could not. Um, the Betts' phone had been ringing off the hook for for weeks since this whole thing kind of blew right. up. The National Enquirer flew them. There was a plane waiting for them and flew them back to Florida while well, they like arrived. a private plane? Like a private plane. Mm -hmm. And when they arrived, Jerry was like, well, what are you guys doing here? And they were like, you you know, they said that you were trying to get a hold of us. And she's like, no. Nan and Dick's versions are slightly different. Nan was under the impression Terry went directly to New Orleans. But Dick and the newspaper say he was first flown to South Florida, and that's where he separated from the ball. But either way, allegedly, Terry is separated from the ball, which winds up in New Orleans at this panel. That part of the story lines up. They go back and um, they request copies of everything they've done and all the whatever information about what they've been doing to the sphere and that window of time they were gone. The scientists were not willing to share any of that. So in the middle of this panel, Terry Betts just stands up takes the sphere and walks out and leaves, gets in his car and takes off back to Florida. And um, Jerry was like, I don't think any of them were expecting him to do that. It was very abrupt. 
Did she share if they ever got to the bottom of who was behind this weird sick call? No. I mean, she felt like it was someone, it was someone involved with that panel. Of the five panelists, the majority have passed away. Hello, WGCT. This is Lindsay. But I was able to get in touch with Leo Sprinkle, hey, the psychologist. I enjoyed my work on the panel, but what I really enjoyed was getting to meet so many interesting people who had described their experiences. He says the panel was active between 1972 and 79, and probably the reason it existed was to increase sales of National Enquirer papers. But he and his colleagues were real scientists and did real work looking into lots of claims. At the time, the price for anyone who could prove extraterrestrial existence would win 50 grand. The Betzes didn't win any cash. It was 1974, and the panel looked at the Betz sphere in New Orleans. Do you have any recollection of that specific uh, object? I'm sorry, I, I don't. Uh, I'm sure it was important at the time, but my memory is faulty, and so I don't, I don't recall. Can you tell me a little bit more? Yeah. Was it, was it a large sphere or a handheld? or? Uh, so it was a metal... Well, the Navy said it was stainless steel. Um, they had looked at it before the panel. and it was. I really tell them heavy. about the vibrating, the rolling, and the even more out there allegations, like Terry allegedly being separated from the ball and it's rolling uphill just before heading to the conference. I mean, does any of that ring a bell? It's a beautiful case, and I'm sorry that I can't contribute anything to it. He repeatedly tells me his memory just isn't what it used to be, that this doesn't mean the ball didn't do anything remarkable. But no, he doesn't remember it. 45 years was a long time ago. Do you think if, if it had rolled, you know, uphill in this way, that, that that's something you would have remembered? Uh, I, I would think, you know, I used to pride myself on my memory. <laughs> and I, I'm sorry, I just don't have a re, any well, recall about the experience. Nan, Jerry had lots more to say. She addressed what Dick told me two years prior, that before the ball headed to South Florida and then New Orleans, in Jacksonville, the Navy took a look at it and wanted to keep it. The officer came to her home to return the sphere. They had The Navy had it for two weeks. And the same day he was supposed to come, the, the naval base called her home. And I think the name of the officer is maybe Berenger. I wrote it down, but I couldn't read. Oh, I think it's Chris Berenger. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think it's actually pronounced Berninger. He's um, the spokesperson in all the articles. Okay. About it. Okay. The Navy called her home before he got there and said, as soon, you know, is you know, is Officer Berenger there? And she's like, no. And she said, well, as soon as he arrives, please have him call us and gave him her number. And she said, okay, no problem. So he got there and he, she let him know that the base was trying to get a hold of him. So he called the base, and she said that she could tell from the phone call that whatever it was was very serious. She said it was very much like, yes, sir, yes, sir. And then he got off, and he asked for the sphere back. He wanted to take it back to the base, and she wouldn't let him. She said, no, I'm sorry. This belongs to us, and we're keeping it, Um, which is such a brave thing to do, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, Most people would say, the Navy is asking for this back. I I have to comply. (laughs) Right. You know, she doesn't know what the conversation was, but they wanted it back. Nan and Dick's versions from Jerry two years apart are pretty consistent. Dick even brought up a specific scientist who came to the family's home to research the ball after the panel. And there was a a pretty well-known professor. He asked permission to come and see the ball and sleep with it. That well-known professor was J. Allen Hynek. The most famous UFO proponent in the world. Yeah, the guy the government hired to debunk UFO claims and later joined the UFO panel, along with Sprinkle, who we just heard from. Nan clarified what Dick meant by Hynek sleeping with the ball. I don't think they got married. <laughs> Hynek reached out. He wanted them to come to Chicago. She said, no, you, you know, if you want to see this video, you're going to have to come to us. So he came, and she said that he was... Just a delightful person. They enjoyed their time together. Um, he was only there for a couple of days. Uh, he asked if he could, um, if this, if he could, you know, bring the sphere into his bedroom overnight. 
um, and she didn't really see any harm in that. Um, she trusted him. He was a government um, scientist, you know, uh, with a you know very you know staunch reputation. So you did bring up that the fact that I want to talk to her. I did. I did. I said that you had read the First Coast Magazine article and you were very interested with her as a mm-hmm. person and you were also interested in, in, in the sphere, you know, just being transparent about mm-hmm. that. Um, but, you know, that you're a fantastic journalist and dedicated to the city and, um, and you know, just telling the human side of how this really how this affected, you know, the family more yeah. so than, you know, some crazy you know, supernatural story. And she, you know, she was very, um, she was very gracious about it. But she was like, you know, Nan, I just don't feel comfortable really sharing this with anyone. She said with anyone but you. And I was like, kind of flabbergasted. I Mm -hmm. was like, you know, thank you so much, Jerry. You know, we just did that one little story on her in that window of time. This was a huge bummer, because I think talking to Jerry is really important. At the same time, I understand she may just not want to talk. I get that. Through this whole process, I've lost a lot of sleep over if I'm digging up too much, if I'm doing more damage than good. So I think selfishly, I kind of want Jerry's blessing that I'm telling this the right way, that I get it. And I don't know if that's going to happen. But she is the key to this story about what this kind of thing does to a person's life, to a family. Nan told me she'd give it another shot. So don't worry, I'm not giving up yet. But as far as this Hynix situation, there are so many articles announcing the ball would be going to this panel in New Orleans, but not a whole lot laying out the panel's findings or confirming Hynix performed any kind of study at Jerry's house. But I did find an old interview of Hynek right after returning from the panel. Let me ask you first, uh, Professor um, Hynek, uh, uh, about your latest uh, evaluations of the sphere. Do you consider this now extraterrestrial or Earth manufactured? This is Oddball, a production made possible by supporters of WJCT Public Media, with additional support from Bold Bean Coffee Roasters. If you like this series, you don't have to stop listening. Go to oddballpodcast.com now to see how you can get all the episodes and check out the Oddball shop. Oddball is produced by me, Lindsay Kilbride, with editing by Jessica Palumbo. The music is by Matthew Wardell and intern Al Pete. 